And uh, eventually I'm going to have to have you guys say on the way we're saying, yeah, that's cool, you can yeah. sit so, yeah, at the university. Feel free to get up nice. Send it to my agent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is our thyroid cartilage to start with. And this would be the dual role of the upper body is representing the arytenoid cartilages, and the lower body is representing the prickly cartilage. So to do this demonstration, remember that your arytenoids have these two processes. The first is the vocal process that's going to be projecting out to the front, and this is the portion that basically anchors the vocal cord, uh, vocal uh, cord, I should say. And then the vocal cord projects up Okay, so these are the vocal processes coming off of the arrhythmics. The other process is the muscular process. That's going to be lifted up to the side. Do the same thing. So basically your arms are at 90 degrees. The arytenoid is one solid piece, whereas the cricoid is a solid piece, but there is movement between them. So whenever I pull, everything in your upper body is rigid. You can only rotate at the waist. So think of it being a statue except for a rotation. Okay? So that's your important rule. Don't screw it up. Alright, so we have a series of muscles that attach from the different cartilages. First one that we're going to talk about is known as the posterior cricoarytenoid. Posterior cricoarytenoid comes off the back of the cricoid cartilage down here and then it reaches up and grabs onto, right, so to the side here, grabs onto the muscular processes of the arytenoids. So when this muscle contracts, when these fibers shorten, what ends up happening is you get posterior rotation, it pulls backwards on the muscular processes, and in doing so, we get this outward rotation that causes what to happen, what we call this movement. Abduction. Abduction of the vocal folds. So the vocal folds come apart. So that's the muscle that's going to be activated when you're taking deep breaths to try and get the vocal processes out of the way so that you can bring um, more air into the system. Next muscle to talk about is the lateral cricoarytenoids. So the cricoid uh, cartilage, you have to remember, is this ring shape that would go all the way around, like the circular ring. So we're not able to show all of that. So these muscles, you would have one on either side of the lateral aspect of the cricoid cartilage, and then that reaches up and grabs onto the muscular process from this direction. So when this muscle contracts, it's going to, no, don't move your feet, only rotate at your waist. When that muscle contracts, what's happening? A deduction of the vocal folds. It brings these around to the front. And that brings the vocal processes closer together. When that happens, happens in a couple of uh, circumstances. When we're speaking, then they're brought in very, very close approximation, but not airtight. So a little bit of air is able to escape, and that allows them to vibrate against one another. Think about when you're a kid. Did you ever take that, uh, in the summertime, did you ever take a blade of grass, put it between your thumbs and make the noise, right? Less a blade of grass vibrating back and forth between your two fingers. Same sort of thing here, is these come close enough that they start to vibrate, and that's what allows us to create phonation or speaking. The other time that we use this is when we do what's called a glottal clot or a valve salva maneuver. And that's when you completely close off the airway, it happens um, reflexively when you swallow. You also engage it when you're at the gym. I mean, with those heavy weights, the muscles squeezing on the blood vessels. So by using a valsalva, you increase your intrathoracic pressure, puts pressure on the heart, helps to push and drive blood. You also use it when you defecate, because that increases thoracoabdominal pressure to squeeze out the contents of your bowels. And you also use it during childbirth, or at least some of us at some point in time. The other muscle that will help with this is something called arytenoides. And it just basically goes from one arytenoid cartilage to the other arytenoid cartilage so that when it contracts, 
<laughs> it pulls the arytenoid cartilages further in together, which causes this further adduction to occur. You guys look silly, so you can relax. Okay. Next set of muscles are responsible for controlling how close the thyroid cartilage is to the arytenoid cartilages. The first one is two muscles, the thyroarytenoidus and also the vocalis. They basically run in the same area. They are parallel to each other. The only difference is the vocalis, much closer to the vocal fold, and actually attaches to it certainly along the line. So, when we're talking, and we engage this muscle, it, and we'll just kind of pretend that we have one on each side, it will pull these structures in closer together. When that happens, what happens to the vocal folds? Well, not slack, because remember, the vocalis along here is around the length, so when it contracts, it makes sure that they, it stays tight along the entire thing, so it shortens it, and then the vocalis makes sure that there's never slack in the system. So that's important to remember. So by shortening the vocal folds, what's the what's the um, what's the effect? Is it going to be higher voice or lower voice? Low voice, right? They're becoming thicker. Right? Think about a bass guitar, bass strings like boom, or when you change the uh, the pitch, when you shorten the string, it's always going to create a lower. Pitch. You can do that with an elastic band too. You hold it uh, under your foot, bring it out to the side, twang it. The more you pull it out, the higher the pitch that the twang is going to sound like. So this is where we get it nice and low. Okay. The other muscle to be aware of is known as the cricothyroid. Now this one's a little bit tough to imagine, but I'm going to have you loosen your grip here for one second. And I want you to bring this arm forward. Because remember, when we look at the thyroid process, or thyroid cartilage, we have this posteriorly directed process that muscle is going to grab onto. So when we look at the cricothyroid, it's not coming from back here up to here. It's actually coming from the anterior surface of the cricoid. And you can see this in the body. It comes from right in front of the cricoid, and then the fibers wrap up to grab on either side to that posterior process. So as a result, if we think about the thyroid, remember it has this hinge type joint that is represented by the ankles here. So when this muscle contracts, the thyroid cartilage gets pulled forward, pivots forward. Now what's happening to the vocal folds while we're doing this? It's lengthening the vocal folds. So what's the result going to be? Higher pitched voice. So what nerve? innervates this muscle. Perfect. Say it loud and proud. The external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. The external branch of superior laryngeal nerve. So when that nerve is engaged, this muscle contracts, and you end up with a really high-pitched voice. So what happens if you damage that nerve? That's all my stuff. Yeah, you can't hit the high. You, you, you can't. You can't try out for the Vienna Voice Choir. Okay, but the rest of phonation should be perfectly fine. Now, what does all of the other muscles? The recurrent branch of the laryngeal nerve. So if we cut that nerve, think carefully. What's the effect going? To be? You wouldn't be able to close them. So it's not just that you lose that low pitch voice. It's that you would have basically paralysis of the vocal fold. Usually this will be a hemiparalysis situation. And if it is, then the individual will have vibration on the one side, but the voice will sound very raspy or hoarse when you listen to it. So important for any of you that go into ENT or if you go into family medicine, you guys can relax. Um, <coughs> if you have a patient that comes to see you, saying your family practice and is complaining about the fact that they're losing their voice and what have you, and sore, raspy voice. Um, you're going to do a laryngoscopy, you know, laryngoscope, kind of take a look at the vocal folds. And that's where you're going to see the false vocal folds on the top and then the true ones underneath. So this is where you have to remember your anatomy. And the 
and think about the structures underneath, the uh, uh, vocal cords underneath the uh, true ones, the inferior. Now, 99 times out of 100 or more, you're going to look at this and the mucosa is going to seem red, inflamed, swollen, and what's your diagnosis? Laryngitis, inflammation of the larynx. That's what laryngitis is. Every once in a while, you might not see any noticeable swelling or inflammation. You ask the patient, okay, say, ah, we well, have this thing down there. Uh, and what you're hoping you don't see, but occasionally you might, is that one of the vocal folds comes across and is taut, and then the other one kind of gets pushed to the side as the air goes out because it's paralyzed. And so it'll actually adduct when it's supposed to adduct, particularly in the middle because it's all loosey-goosey. So this is something that we more commonly see associated with the left focal fold. What is that an indication of, potentially? An aortic arch aneurysm is one thing that it could be. And then what's the other thing? A uh, mediastinal tumor form. Because of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, as you're all now aware, that's the one that's going to wrap underneath the arch of the aorta on the left-hand side, come back up. And if you have anything that's pushing on it, uh, aortic arch aneurysm or tumor formation, that's going to get the hemicrosis. So that's a red flag, a very early warning sign of something fairly serious. You can get them on the right as well. Now, where does the right recurrent wrap underneath? Subclavian artery. So we can sometimes get what's called a pancoast tumor. That's tumor formation within the neck, and some of the other things that you'll see with that is vena cava uh, syndrome, vena, vena cava dilation, and so you'll see dilation of the jugular vein because of the compression that's being put on in that spot. But if you see one specifically on the right side, and that's very close to where the recurrent wraps around the right subclavian, and so consequently we also might get that right kind of paralysis in that Questions about any of that, anything that I missed? Okay, cut.